Let's start. So I am uh, Nadari, um, and I am going to speak about uh, this wonderful stuff, like optimizing uh, assets for the loading performance in Web UI perspective, of course. Uh, so introduction. Who am I? Nadari Varenko, uh, Web UI software engineer here in SoftServe. Um, and the first thing uh, that I'm showing you to just get your attention, 53% of uh, visitors uh, would be reject uh, site if it won't load in three seconds. So um, one more time, if your site, your application loads. Uh, more than three seconds, uh, people would not use it. 53% of people won't use it, uh, according to this SOASTA uh, analytics. Uh, agenda for today. Um, the first thing is metrics and measurements. Second, un uh, unnecessary loads, size of encoding text base uh, assets, images optimization, fonts, HTTP caching, performance in uh, investigation. I will show some demo of how to do it in real time. Uh, and real user measurement, and then tools. Okay, so um, the very common thing um, happens when uh, tech leads or seniors get asked about uh, performance, web UI performance. And typically, the, they would reply like, I tested my application, it loads in blah, blah, blah seconds. That's absolutely not right, because we can't say it's so. Uh, next slide would explain why we can't. So do you see how progressively um, mobile YouTube renders itself? Let's watch it one more time. We see nothing, then screens, on the, then some icons, and et cetera, et cetera. We can't say, like, it lowers in certain time. There are a bunch more uh, numbers that represent the loading itself. So let's see in detail how it works. First we see like empty screen. Then we see some hero elements, let's say. Uh, some, the most important piece of the YouTube, of why we came here at, at least. Then some loading icons, uh, some, some list of proposed uh, videos, then some images appear to represent this video. And that's it. Uh, so, we can say um, that, okay, now, uh, we have some kind of breakpoint here. The first pane appears in uh, two seconds with something. Um, then first content appeared when um, YouTube player uh, were rendered. Then some loading icons. Um, then first meaningful paint. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, that mean? That metric means that user now uh, has something to read or to watch. And in our case, it is uh, this um, like proposed videos, title of the upcoming video that user will see, uh, and. Uh, in the end, time to interactive. It is the moment when user is able to interact with the page. I mean, tap, swap, uh, I don't know, like click or whatever. Um, and that, that's it uh, in terms of metrics and measurements. Um, now let's see how to achieve this stuff. Uh, well, actually, it is one of my favorite uh, quotes in terms of uh, web load optimization. The fastest and the best optimized resource 
is a resource that is not sent. Um, and about unnecessary loads. Uh, I saw a lot of cases when like user uh, when developers add for example jQuery just for single method. Uh, for example, I'm adding uh, hundreds of kilobytes just to use single method like toggle class or add class or for adding click handler or whatever. And the same stuff with underscore, lodash, bootstrap, moment.js. Um, my, my message here is um, think whether you need uh, these libraries or not. If you are just interested in single method, uh, then probably implementing this method yourself is not a bad idea. Or, I don't know, make sure that these uh, libraries might be optimized by Webpack, some tree shaking mechanisms. So, um, filter the libraries you are using. And next topic is um, in fact it's called AMD. Um, a lot of projects uses um, like single bundle for everything. In fact, two bundles like uh, mm, bundle with the vendor script and some uh, application bundle. And probably most of you can find their their projects uh, in that way. So um, the message is chunk. Use chunks. Uh, use like split your huge um, bundle with some pieces that would be loaded only if they are needed. The best case um, for the loading if we load only script that user would need. So it's the best optimized, I would say. Uh, let's imagine this uh, kind of application where you have uh, some application, uh, then you have like module one, module two, uh, like I don't know, some user settings and dashboard and in settings user has uh, some, I don't know, permissions, in permissions uh, he has like password, yep. Uh, and here I want to say that you should not um, load everything. Um, make sure that you you split uh, your modules, your chunks, in a way that user would load only stuff that, that he needs. Another good thing here is eliminating unnecessary uh, unused code. Recently, I don't know, in fact not so recently, uh, this feature were introduced uh, about a year in, uh, ago. Um, it's called like code coverage. It's about finding code that is not used uh, while some period of time. Um, people typically use it, uh, for example, like um, I'm rendering my page and I'm trying to see what script is used and what is not used. Uh, here in this screenshot you can see uh, the, the result of this recording. So somebody clicks this record button, then uh, recording starts. Uh, Google Chrome starts capturing all this stuff that is used uh, and here is presented in this green line. Uh, so when you click on it, you can see uh, actually the lines of code uh, that is not used by marked by this red line on the left of the code. I found it um, pretty useful 
uh, tool for understanding some of the pieces that might be um, like moved to another module or like split it up in the separate chunks so user will not have to load um, this script while loading some page because he doesn't uh, need it, this script in unused. Of course, it's not uh, always applicable because we have a lot of if statements that work under some conditions, but the, most of the cases might be uh, optimized. Okay. Um, the next thing is optimizing. So, uh, if we, we talked uh, about uh, eliminating uh, resources, like how to not load it. Now let's talk about how to maximally optimize it if you can't eliminate it. Uh, the very first thing uh, comes to my mind is like parsing and minification. Uh, there are a lot of tools like for uh, concatenation, for minification. For example, AgglifyJS probably is the most popular for uh, optimizing JavaScript sources. It would even replace your variables with shorter names, uh, what um, affects the size of the whole JavaScript a lot. Uh, there are a lot of like uh, concatenation tools um, Google Clojure, uh, I, I won't name them all because there are too much. Uh, but the important thing here, uh, do not forget optimize SVG. It's common pitfall I see uh, when uh, people optimize JavaScript and do not optimize CSS. They optimize CSS, but CSS and JavaScript, but didn't uh, optimize uh, HTML. They and the same stuff with SVG. Um, do not ignore the SVG because I have some slide for that further. Okay, um, the next thing is uh, compression. Uh, probably the most of you knows uh, about uh, JZIP. Uh, it's algorithm most commonly used right now, how it works. Uh, here we see like server, network, and browser. Uh, browser requests uh, some source from the server. Server compresses it uh, and uh, passes it over the network to the browser and browser decompresses it. And uh, then browser would be able to use it. So, um, it's a common algorithm, I would say. How it works, how a um, browser understands um, stuff, uh, like how to decode this stuff. When a browser sends request to the resource, we uh, can see accept encoding header in the request headers for every request that you are doing to your server. This uh, header is uh, added automatically by your browser. Uh, and in our case, we see that browser says, says to the backend, to the server, that he will be able to parse like gzip, uh, deflare, deflate, and brr. brr. <laughs> um, this stands for the broadly. Um, and when server sends the response, he told the browser like what algorithm was used to decode, uh, to compress this request. And in our case, it's broadly. Uh, what is broadly? Um, it's kind of new standard that uh, Google introduced, I don't know, like four years ago. It's not commonly used yet, uh, but I I don't know, I'm forcing you to start using it um, because, um, as we can see here, uh, it has um, like 
better results than uh, JZIP has. In fact, uh, every um, compression algorithm would uh, might be represented with three or four values, like how much it saves this value, uh, how fast uh, it decompress, and how fast it compress. Uh, every algorithm, like JZIP and Brotley in our case, uh, has different values of, comp of compression. Uh, what does it mean? Um, if uh, algorithm uh, has more saving value, like it compresses uh, in more detailed way, I don't know, um, it would um, need to spend more time to decompre decompress it and uh, respectively it would have to uh, spend much more time to decompress it for uh, in and in this case we are getting more value more saving value but we will need to spend more time for uh, compressing and decompressing this uh, box i don't know and um, in this case, uh, let's pay attention to these uh, slides. JZIP uh, and Brotley ha uh, has like the standard uh, level of compression, and it's four uh, for the Brotley. Uh, it means that it works in most optimized way. So it's like median for saving and uh, for um, decompression. Uh, the killer feature of Brotley, it, it, it's much easier to decompress the br uh, box with, uh, which is compressed by Brotley algorithm. And in this case, we will get much more saving and uh, much faster uh, decompression. But Brotley uh, loses, loses uh, to GZIP. Uh, when it comes to the compression, broadly is much difficult to compress. But uh, I would say that it's acceptable because we can pre-compile, pre-compress uh, the file we are going to send to the browser. So in our case, uh, we can do it like in that way when browser requests from the server some file and then uh, server instead of compressing it selects compressed broadly uh, file br broadly compressed file uh, and passes it to the browser and decompresses it uh, in that way we will get some benefits of that and a few statistics about broadly um, Google Play says that it if one and a half petabytes per day. <laughs> Some incredible numbers, but anyway. Um, LinkedIn uh, improved a lot of time. This strange company saved saved 17% just with using Broadly. So at least consider using this Broadly algorithm on your project. What's more, uh, transpiling JavaScript sources. Um, 
I'm talking about using like ECMAScript 6, 7, 20, 20 uh, or whatever modern to uh, modern standard you are using. Uh, the most of the browsers nowadays support everything from ECMAScript 6. Uh, pay attention to this area, like to this area. Um, here we can see that everything uh, like Edge, uh, like Firefox, Google Chrome, uh, and uh, other sites, uh, browsers support this stuff. And typically, the the default config for every transpiler is to transpile to ECMAScript 5. So even uh, yeah, IE, I mean IE 8 support uh, will work with your. Um, sources, but um, I'm uh, asking you to analyze your supported browsers and if um, all supported browsers are in this list, then do not transpile to ECMAScript 5. Uh, it would save you a lot of, um, I don't know, size, size budgets. Uh, just by removing these annoying polyfills, the redundant polyfills, and even might improve some performance because now you will use um, modern uh, Im implementations instead of uh, manually implemented polyfills. Okay, how to achieve it? Babel has very nice uh, tool called Babel Preset End, uh, and it has this configuration like I want to support all last two versions of browsers and Safari uh, greater than or equal seven. Uh, that means that this, uh, if you configure your Babel, Babel in this way. Uh, it will go to this uh, application every time when uh, you compile, uh, when you transpile sur uh, sources with Babel, and will take, uh, will look on the last two versions and choose the polyfills that you will need. It's kind of smart too, um, but not everything is works with uh, uh, not everything works with uh, Babel so uh, you can do the same stuff with TypeScript but not in so smart way you will have to analyze your uh, browsers and uh, things that you might need to use uh, only by your hands so it's kind of manual stuff, and if you see that uh, you support browsers that support uh, ECMAScript 6, uh, then just change it uh, manually in your TypeScript config files. Okay, next. Um, optimizing size of JavaScript sources. Um, Webpack scope hosting. Very interesting thing. Uh, recently introduced, I don't know, in Webpack 3 or 4 even. Uh, how it works? Uh, previously, we had like, for example, two chunks, and uh, each chunk uh, uh, contains some modules. For for example, this example module, then some module uh, that uh, that would be lazy loaded, then this lazy loaded module would load module C, then D, then CJS. Uh, CJS might uh, import this shared module, shared, shared two, and uh, in fact, <laughs> real project has much more deeper uh, nesting, and this import has a lot of, uh, in fact, not a lot of, but some performance issues, and um, imagine the case can eliminate this uh, import and use it just in that way. So uh, 
uh, when we are loading, uh, for example, from uh, example module, uh, we are loading lazy module that would load C and D module, we will require just uh, this scope box. So we, we will, abstractly uh, speaking, we will require only one file, and uh, which will contain these three modules. Then f from this scope we will require this scope that would contain these two modules. And in that way we are el eliminating the um, quantity of the imports uh, and uh, in that way uh, size of the JavaScript sources uh, will be reduced. Okay, moving on. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, here we have the list of advantages. Smaller bundle, faster, better minification. <coughs> faster because you will not need to uh, require another module each time. The next nice thing in uh, Webpack is tree shaking. Um, I, I guess a lot of you knows uh, how it works, but uh, not everybody w w know how to write shakeable code. For example, um, we have some math object uh, in our math.js. It has uh, two nice methods like square and cube. Um, then we will just import math method from math.js and use it like math.cube uh, too. And it uh, works just fine, but imagine another case uh, where you have two separate functions. Uh, square and cube in the same math.js uh, um, and it works almost in the same way. Um, here is the thing, when you uh, use object or some something grouped uh, it won't be shakeable and if you are using separate uh, instances of anything it would be shakeable. Um, so that means, in, in two words, um, how tree shaking works. If we have an application that requires only square method, method, then uh, tree shaking will exclude this cube method from the bundle. And in this way, when we are requiring math object, a tree shaking mechanism would not be able to shake this cube method. Uh, so the message here is, uh, if you are, if you have like independent pieces that might be shakeable, then write it in the, this way. It's actually um, applicable. It's applicable to writing uh, classes uh, that are tiny enough that. Uh, this webpack might uh, dramatically reduce the size of the bundles itself. Okay, uh, moving on to the images optimization. Uh, the very first thing I want to say, prefer vector formats uh, versus raster formats. Here you can see why, because the main benefit of using SVGs is that they are scalable. It, it, it not depends on the uh, screen size or screen zoom or whatever. Another nice thing that uh, another I don't know um, another thing why you should choose uh, SVG is that they are text based. Uh, a set and you can minify and compress. So um, use the same broadly uh, algorithm and use minification. Here is the example of uh, minification I applied to 
this uh, SVG. Here is the result of that text, and um, here is the compressed version of the SVG. As you can see, it uh, removed a lot of metadata comments, uh, like optional um, attributes, and it were reduced from this bunch of text to this bunch of bunch of text. Like I, I see a lot of win, and, and in fact, first version were. Uh, Okay, here is the numbers of improvement. And it was improved by tool SVGO that might be used even on the CI because it's like just common line tool uh, written for on the Node.js. Um, another slide here about picking the best uh, raster image. If you can't use SVG. It's, if it's like, um, I don't know, photo of a pretty cat, then uh, you will have to pick the best raster image format. Here is a um, simple algorithm how uh, you will choose it. Uh, if it needs to be animated, you will choose GIF. Uh, if it's not, then um, if it's not and need to be preserved the final de fine de detail, then uh, choose PNG. If not, JPEG. Uh, so just remember this table and use it. Uh, images optimization. Uh, the, another images optimization that might be uh, performed on your image. Uh, there are a lot of tools that can remove the image meta metadata, uh, like where this uh, image were take taken, I mean uh, the uh, geodata, uh, then what, from what device this image were captured. All, all this stuff is stored in the image itself, and tools might uh, tools will remove this data from your image with what will lead to the reducing the size of the image itself. Uh, then experiment, experiment with the optimal quality. If you remove, uh, reduce the size of the image quality uh, down to 80% from the original one, it won't have almost any visible uh, effect, but uh, it will reduce the size of the image almost in a half. So experiment with it and optimize it. Another pitfall that I see a lot of times is using of scaled images. Here is a nice example uh, how you shouldn't uh, do. Here we have image uh, tag in the HTML that is 100 pixels uh, width and 100 pixels height. And image that is loaded over the network is 300 pixels and uh, 300 pixels square, let's say in that way. Uh, don't do it, because you can save a lot of uh, make uh, a lot of bytes uh, over the network. Um, do the same thing you have. If image is 100, per, uh, 100 pixels square, then load 100 pixels square uh, in image. <laughs> okay, uh, another dummy uh, pit fail that you can fall in. Um, GIF using uh, this GIF uh, for the video. Here is an example of the video that is uh, done by SVG and it has uh, 18 megabytes size. And, okay, start please. Oh, yeah. Uh, here is the same thing, but uh, 
is it's done by video. Um, here is the comparison size. Like you 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 can save up to 10 megabyte megs, and even more you can play with image quality uh, and reduce this size down to one megabyte. So if you are using complex GIF animations, uh, then consider using video instead of uh, that animation. Okay, shortly about font optimizations. Um, audit and monitor your font use. Uh, subset your font resources. Um, that means that combine them uh, to like, okay, no, never mind. Um, give uh, precedence to the local in your SRC list, uh, customize font loading uh, and rendering. <laughs> in fact, I, I hear a, a very nice quote uh, from the Ideos Money uh, that if you can't load your font quickly, then do not load it at all. Because in the most of the cases, font is a very critical piece of our load that blocks rendering itself. And user won't see anything uh, until he load fonts. Consider uh, showing your application without uh, that font first. Then uh, when the font becomes cached, uh, show it the next time. Show it the next time when user uh, enters your page. Um, okay, uh, HTTP caching checklist briefly. Uh, use consistent URLs. Uh, that means uh, do not serve um, diff uh, the same ki uh, the same content under different URLs. If it is uh, your for example, vendor bundle, serve it like vendor bundle.js everywhere. Uh, do not have um, few versions of the same resource. Uh, ensure that the server provides validation e tag. Uh, and of course, minimize charm. Yeah, and he, uh, I forgot to mention about um, using third-party intermediates. Um, for example, uh, CDNs. If you can move something to the CDN, then move it. Of course, you have you you might have uh, constraints in security or something else in co build build complexity or another con constraint that you might have, but if you can move uh, your assets to the CDN, then do it, because CDN is built just for serving uh, static resources, stat uh, static assets, and it does it very nice. Okay, time for performance investigation. Okay, um, let's see something on uh, YouTube. Uh, .com. Uh, let me refresh it, so mobile application. No, in fact, it doesn't does load mobile application. Anyway, I can do it manually. As I remember, it's easy to load. Okay, I do not remember the link to the mobile version. Maybe it's here. Mm, no, okay, anyway, let's optimize this stuff. Or even we, we can we can uh, get the Google page itself. Why it's not responsive? What 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 is going on? Okay. Anyway, um, let's dig into the profiling. Here we can uh, we see nice uh, capture, like 
capture video uh, icon. Let's click on it. Uh, it. It will show the screenshots of the state in the certain time when some of the resources are loaded. Then, uh, delete uh, the bad network condition. We can do it like here uh, to em emulate fast 3, 3G. 3G, I mean. <laughs> uh, and uh, what is the next? As I remember, it's performance. Yeah, here, it, uh, here we go. CPU, we can down our CPU to some condition. So typically, uh, average user in the internet has smartphone that costs less than 200 bucks. And it's kind of slow smartphone. And you will need to take care of everybody. And in this case, uh, we will throttle our CPU uh, for times down. Okay, we have network conditions, we, can, we have hardware conditions. Let's start the debugging. Uh, hit F5. Hitting F5. It's capturing. Okay, here we go. Um, now we can see uh, the screenshots here. So the first content appeared less than in a second. Then something additional appears, and additional, and and that's it. In fact, the, it's very very quick uh, demo with the quick, but well optimized resource. So uh, another thing that is important, you can here uh, uh, here you can find the priority of the resources. So uh, and. In that way, you can understand why it's loaded in this order. Um, here we, we have high uh, priority resource and then some uh, resources with lower priority. This priority is used to uh, used by the browser and uh, V8 to build the sequence of the resources, how it will be loaded by the browser. Okay. So that's it for the demos. I want to present. Um, and one of the last slides is um, about real user measure, measurement. Uh, recently, browser uh, has implemented another tool for us for measuring this performance uh, for the real, real users. Uh, we have new performance observer. Uh, what it does? It has very simple API. It accepts function uh, that would be invoked in some point of time. And some point of time depends on uh, when uh, and what is happening on the page right now. For example, if you do uh, want to capture the paint time for, the, for, for your users, Everything you will need to load this script uh, in very high priority, so it will become executed first. Then uh, pass some callback uh, to this class that will uh, gather uh, some time and send it somewhere uh, to your like analytic. Uh, and the important thing that um, this script has to be in the very high priority. So it won't work right if you load this script after your styles, for example. 
Okay, um, the last slide here is uh, tools that you will need to optimize your performance. Uh, in fact, it's uh, image optimization tools, SVGO that I used for uh, SVG optimization and showed it previously and other stuff. And uh, another tools that you will need to minify your uh, JavaScript sources, see uh, ECMAScript compatibility matrix, preset and Vagrify dev tool. Uh, another important uh, resource is web page test. Uh, here you can like get a list of advisors that will help you to uh, understand what you can improve in your page. It accepts just URL, runs a bunch of the tests uh, on your site and will give you report that would say you have ability to improve performance here and here and here and do that and do that. Um, of course, it, it's not the whole list of the resources, but I would say um, the list of important one and the list of unknown one. What I didn't cover uh, in this presentation, uh, HTTP2 capabilities, uh, asset, how to prioritize your assets, and of course caching uh, via service workers. It's another topic that requires uh, another presentation. And the very last thought that you uh, will need to understand. Performance is not about one-time fix. You will need to uh, take care of it a lot of, uh, all, during all time. Uh, that means that you will need to optimize it, then measure it, then uh, monitor it, and repeat this cycle every time with almost every build, I don't know, depending on your SDLC. So, the pre uh, link to the presentation here, I did this presentation for uh, like conference so people can get link right now and but I will share it with you uh, and thanks any questions anything it's time for us time to ask questions Nice presentation. Actually, I just want to uh, add that uh, you do can uh, animate SVG also, so we don't need to to use uh, any animated stuff. I mean, uh, if we want to have a static animation, that's fine, but uh, but we can also just animate SVGs if possible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. I, uh, the slide was about uh, complex animations, like that looks like video. I understand. There's also a weird trick which uh, guys from the uh, from one game, one online game, uh, are doing that. That, that they are uh, for really heavy animations. They are preferring just uh, to show the video with low quality because for the animations with not much colors, it's uh, more optimized than SVGs. Yeah. That, that's, uh, that sounds weird, but uh, they are using like uh, some context and uh, they are showing some movies instead of showing animations because GIFs are not optimized really. League of Legends, yeah, yeah, that was League of Legends, and they are using this this uh, movies instead of animations in SVG. That's yeah. that's tricky, but uh, yeah. Absolutely. Awesome, right. awesome, awesome uh, presentation, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Another questions from the audience?